Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you all here this morning. We've got a really, really good session that um, I hope will open your minds to new new frontiers, I guess that's what we'll call them. Um, well, what we're going to do this morning is we have uh, Jim Ristow, who uh, uh, has a company called Ag Connection. Uh, he wears other hats as well. Uh, he does a lot of things. But uh, the big thing that Jim has done in the last, oh, I don't know, many years is he's become self-educated uh, in the soil micro microbiology realm. Um, he's taken a number of courses. Uh, he's he's, he's uh, almost uh, devoted most of his life to 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 learning about soil biology. We're, we're friends. I've known Jim a long time and, and uh, I've learned a lot from him. And so we invited him to do a session in crop hour. Um, he's got a short or he's got a PowerPoint presentation and then he's gonna, he's gonna put his microscope on and talk about different things that he's seen. And uh, we're gonna learn from him. So please ask questions. Um, ask ask a lot of questions about things. Don't don't think that there is a um, a stupid question because there is no stupid questions. And uh, and just just use Jim's uh, knowledge uh, because he's really self taught and devoted to this. So so with that, um, we'll do the CCA credits at the end as normal. There'll be a short poll at the end as normal. Um, but I think uh, that's all we need to do to kick this thing off. So, uh, Jim, if you're ready to to share your PowerPoint and get going, uh, let's 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 do it. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Um, let me get started here if I can. Hopefully, you can see that. We good? Yep, we're good, Jim. Okay. So um, Anthony asked me to introduce this uh, soil biology. I guess, who am I? I, uh, I? I trained under the soil food web with Dr. Elaine Ingham. And then I've also taken some other online classes. Nicole Masters uh, has some online classes. And also right now I'm currently taking uh, some really interesting classes through Matt Powers. And um, Matt Powers has written a book entitled uh, Regenerative Soil. And some of the images I'm going to use are from that book. And if you have uh, a curiosity about exploring how nature does nutrient cycling, how it really works, uh, and how plants get their nutrition, and how biology plays a role, I really encourage you to look at this regenerative soil textbook that he's written. It, it's ask, it's going to change the paradigm in agriculture. I firmly believe that as we get a, a, you know, a further and further understanding of how this works. Um, okay, I need to advance my slide. Here we go. And this is right out of the textbook, but it really gives us a picture of this kind of new paradigm. You know, you can go get a PhD in every one of these, uh, in every one of these areas. And I feel like, you know, we know a lot about the soil, but there's so much more to, to learn. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's this soil biology sector is just one area. So all these things have to kind of come together to get into this you know, as we talked about carbon and nutrient cycling in the last crop hours, uh, we're really talking about getting these uh, processes working. And it's it's kind of like, uh, you know, an operating system, a systems approach. You know, we know a lot about sand, silt, and clay, uh, all kinds of information on the physics of soil. That's kind of like you know, your, your, uh, your computer, right? And then there's inside the computer, you have all the things that make it work. These are the software things. And, and then even beyond that, you have the operators and that's where the life comes in. And you have to put all these things together to make a system that works. So I just thought that was a really neat analogy. 
and we're we're narrowing this down the biological section of that regenerative graph i showed you and and this is such a busy slide here but it's really it it shows you the complexity of this soil food web and this this was popularized by Elaine Ingham. She did this work for the NRCS many years ago and, and kind of showed how the plants and the biology are connected in all these different pathways. And, and this is how nutrients cycle in the soil. Uh, and today we're gonna learn a little bit more about who these critters are and what they do. And it's really just, tropic levels in nutrient cycling uh, that start with bacteria, as you can see on this graph, bacteria and the roots and how things begin with that. And then everything else kind of feeds off of that cycle. This is a closer view of that connection there, there's interactions going on right at the very tip of the plant roots and the root hairs. And it, it's um, uh, really where the nutrient exchange and the plant needs for nutrients is taking place. And we're gonna, I, I just wanted to introduce that before I introduce all these other critters. Because to get this to all work the way it can work, you need all the players. And, and so much of what we do doesn't, uh, it isn't conducive for life for them in the soil. And, and when we start looking at nutrient cycling, we have to, and, and soil health, which is the topic of this whole discussion, soil health is an appreciation of the life that's there. And, and that's, that's when you start seeing healthy soils, healthy plants, and then all, as we know, healthy animals, healthy humans. And this is a term you may or may not have heard. If you have never heard it, I strongly encourage you to dig in and research the rhizophagy cycle or rhizophagy cycle, depending on how you want to say it. And this was discovered in Australia about 10 years ago. That's how new this uh, level of understanding is. 10 years ago, they discovered that a plant is actually taking in microbes and dissolving those microbes through a process called with superoxide. This is really getting out of my league. And I'm just trying to put this into terms that, that if I can understand it, hopefully then I can help communicate it to others. But uh, the, as the microbes are taking into the plant, the cell wall is dissolved and the nutrients are absorbed by the plant as it needs them and then the remainder of what's left of that bacteria which includes the dna gets shot out as a root exudate into the soil to propagate that community of microbes over and over and over so it creates this positive feedback loop to where the plant is actually farming the microbes for the nutrients that it needs and and this is this is out there, but this is uh, really exciting to me to think that this is how uh, we can obtain nutrients basically from nature. And here's another, the, there, there's another level of this, these, these uh, microbes that can actually be taken into the plant and move throughout the plant, as well as up to above the surface to the plant leaves and throughout these, these are called endophytes. And these are microbes that can do things like capture nitrogen and cycle it throughout the plant. Uh, in addition to what we've traditionally thought of, well, it's gotta come in through the water. So there's a whole nother mechanism of nutrient cycling when you have this system working. And I, I just, uh, you know, with the new microscopes and the new technologies that I've learned through the Matt Powers course, we can even get a picture of this. This is a this is a uh, a root that was grown in a inoculated, really healthy soil, 
uh, that I actually, this was out of a pot that I have growing right now that has a cover crop mix in it. And I just snipped off a little piece of root and uh, captured this picture. And it's actually dried out a little bit, but you can see all these networks that are formed and, and uh, kind of gives you an idea of what this rhizophagy looks like. And, you know, we just haven't really looked at this before, or, or at least not in the, uh, with the idea of, you know, understanding what our plant needs and, and uh, how do you uh, deal with fertility and your nutrient management plan. So this, this adds another level to all of this. We're going to start out with those really basic level of, of things at the very basic nutrient cycling that takes place is through bacteria. And, and we know this, um, a lot of this is, uh, you know, look, this is a picture of wild diversity. And I started a short video here and you'll, you'll see things go in and out of focus, but this is all bacteria. Uh, we don't really even worry anymore about, okay, there might be a hundred or 200 different species here and you cannot identify them with the microscope. But what we're looking for is diversity. Now there's one that maybe you don't want to see that, that with the spiral like motion, uh, that would indicate that this likely came from some anaerobic conditions or conditions that are moving anaerobically. You'll see clusters, you'll see individuals, you'll see snake like things, you'll see uh, individual round ones, you'll see rod shaped ones. All of these are doing something and serving a purpose in the soil to get nutrients cycling. So they, each one of these microbes has, it requires a little bit of nitrogen and a little bit of carbon at the bacterial level. Nitrogen, it, it, it's in a ratio of one to five. So one part nitrogen, five parts carbon for these bacteria to conduct their life cycle. And their purpose is just to reproduce and propagate. And a lot of that is determined by the environment they're in. So if something is not healthy for a particular microbe or bacteria, then, then they, you won't see that many of that particular species, but you may see a lot of something else that really likes that in condition. And we, we see this in, you know, when we do things like tillage or, you know, the soil health practices that we've been learning about, you'll change this bacterial diversity. And a lot of times you'll expand it. So it gets really, really huge. And the reason it does is because some of the things we're doing is taking out this next level of nutrient cycling are the things that eat bacteria. Okay, so let's look at that. Oops, I, the next level up is um, what we are generally terming fungal. This is a picture of a real diverse fungal network. These are actually saprophytic fungi. You see the heavy, thick, brownish color, just a classic fungi that you should see in a healthy soil. Uh, they're identified uh, as, as a linear structure. Branching is indicative of fungi, saprophytic fungi. Also, you can see there's these separations in the fungi. They're called septa. And th that is really what you're looking for to identify really good functioning fungi in your soil. You'll see other thinner ones, clear ones. Some of those may be more like uh, molds and, and water molds, those sorts of things. Depending on where you took your sample, it, it'll kind of tell you more about what uh, the fungal community might be. But there again, uh, you know, we're not necessarily able, at least I'm not able to tell you exactly what species of fungi that is. And I can't even tell you what it might be doing, but you want to see them. So that's kind of the new paradigm that we're looking for and learning about is 
what are the families of trophism to cycle nutrients that we should be seeing in a healthy soil? So next there's above the fungi is, I'm sorry, uh, is the amoeba. And this is a testate amoeba, a good healthy soil. You should see these throughout, maybe one to three per view at 400X. Um, this one is testate. That means he's built a little bit of a shell around him and he's, he's, uh, he's digesting. He's taking a break and digesting. And that's what you'd like to see. These eat bacteria and they also help cycle nutrients for fungi. The fungi are connecting to soil aggregates, kind of like we saw in that earlier picture of the root. And uh, I had, the, these can actually swim around uh, when they're outside of what is called the test. And I had a video of that, but I, I just, I couldn't come up with it and it didn't show up very well. I Maybe next time I can have a naked, they're very rare to see. And uh, it's because they're clear and they're just hard to see through in, in, in where your focus is. You know, this is a drop on a slide from uh, a, a soil that we probably took one gram. We took one gram of soil and put it into a solution and we're taking one drop out of that and um, putting it on a slide and taking a look. And as we go up through these levels of critters uh, these these uh, higher level don't need as much of that nitrogen but they do need carbon so when you get to the protozoa level which we're in here the here you see a stocked ciliate uh, he's trying to get food and he's going to need some nitrogen and he's going to need some carbon. And that where I'm getting at is as you go up, flagellates are another one. And if you can see this uh, out of focus, and we'll we'll see this when I go live with the microscope, but that's a flagellate and he's out of focus because he's swimming when I snap the picture. But they're a little bit bigger than ba the bacteria. The bacteria are the tiny little dots. The flagellate is that out of focus, and then this is a ciliate. So you can see these things getting bigger and bigger. They need more carbon in their diet and not as much nitrogen. So when this flagellate eats this bacteria, he's getting his contents. He's getting one part nitrogen and five parts carbon. Well, he needs to eat probably five of these to, to get the carbon needs. And then the next thing needs to eat maybe a hundred of those to get his carbon needs. And they end up with an excess of nitrogen. So what do you do with excess nitrogen? Well, you poop it out. And, and what we're looking at here is the poop loop, it's called. Nitrogen is being excreted by these microbes and that it becomes plant available. And, and if this is happening at that root tip, that's where our nutrient cycling is taking place. And it, it's, uh, it gets bigger and bigger as the bigger the critters are that eat the smaller critters, the more nitrogen you have. It accumulates. And they're, they're getting that from either the organic nitrogen that's in the soil or, as I mentioned earlier, there, there's, there's ways for it to get it from the atmosphere if you have the right condition in the plant to do that. We often don't. Um, next is a nematode. You know, you, you hear about nematodes and you think, well, we got a nematode problem. We got to get rid of them. But probably 90% of the nematodes are beneficial and they're essential for nutrient cycling. You look at, this is a bacterial feeder. He eats a lot of bacteria. And this is the you know, just a zoom picture in of the same nematode. There's a fungal strand next to that nematode. And you're starting to see the full picture here of this nutrient cycling process. Excess nitrogen through the whole thing. And other nutrients. I, this is a, uh, a fungal seed inoculant 
that I made. So the point of, of this inoculant was to soak some seeds in it and try to get this seed inoculated with this biology right at germination. And uh, I encourage you to explore that. Um, I know on our farm, we're going to put fungal seed inoculant on every, everything we plant on our farm this year. My brother farms and we've been, uh, you know, experimenting and trying these different things. And uh, you start to see uh, just a healthier plant from the get-go when you have the right inoculant. Just like rhizobia on a soybean or an alfalfa, there's a whole host of, inoc you know, endophytes that are going to allow that plant to start that rhizophagy. And this is a little video, and you can see the diversity of, there again, bacteria. They're just vibrating in there. Uh, there's there's things that are encased in clay. So this is this was a dry commercial mycorrhizal fungal inoculant. And they'll put propagules in there. So this came from a soil that had had inoculation. And it's little pieces of roots and things that have the fungal endophytes in them. And uh, a lot of these, you know, if you look at a dry fungal inoculant product, it's a powder. And that's uh, a lot of clay in there, a lot of clay materials that will stick to your seed. And that's what these bigger brown clumps are. But you see a lot going on there. This was just a little bit of that fungal inoculant powder. I think the of the concentration that I had, uh, one pound would do one acre of land. So it's pretty uh, concentrate. And I took just a little bit of that, put it in some water, and this is what I see. So I would not be scared to put this on my seeds. This is this would be a good thing to uh, to inoculate. And I just wanted to show what that looks like before we go on a live. And I have, I think I have a couple more uh, slides that show this. You know, things that I wanted to make sure we saw. The next level up above the nematodes is these bigger critters that some of them you can start to see with the naked eye. This is just a snap of a, of a, I, I got a picture of this is a rotifer and he just perfectly posed from the underside. So we're looking at him from the bottom up and uh, you can see the complexity. So again, he needs way more carbon than nitrogen for his life cycle. So he has to eat to obtain that carbon. Um, some other things with my microscope that we're doing is changing the light, bringing in light sources from the top uh, to illuminate things rather than just looking at a silhouette of things. When you're looking at a liquid, it's often just a silhouette of the microbes that you see. So it takes light from the bottom to see that. But this is actually lit from the top, and it's with a wavelength that... Uh, reflects phosphorus. It's very specific. So it's like a black light, in other words. And you have to be at the right magnification and using the right lighting sources to do this. But uh, it's just a fascinating picture to me till you look at the complexity of what's going on in these roots. This is, this is a root hair, or a root, I would call it more so, then you have the root hairs that are connecting all these things. And that's where those root exudates come out in just bursts of, of uh, you know, metabolites from photosynthesis. And it brings the microbial community there and they start building a home for themselves. And they, this is the beginning of humus formation and or building organic matter. And the critical role that the biology plays in this food chain to make this work. And uh, I have, as we go live, I want to show some pictures of some roots that uh, I just pulled this morning out of that healthy system. Here's another picture of a root. And you see this interconnectivity in the channels. These are between the cell walls of the plant in the root and and that's where this 
endophyte uh, process is happening. You, and you can see this. And with stains, they can really see it. Dr. James White uh, has some incredible pictures of this process. And when you can see it, it's like a game changer. It, you know, it really becomes real. And that's what we're looking at here is kind of these H-like structures and things moving between the cell walls. And you only see that with this, uh, this wavelength of light. Or you get, I shouldn't say that's the only way, but it's one way to help bring that home. Uh, I'm going to switch screens here now, hopefully. And... Uh, Anthony, jump in if you need to. Yeah, you're getting it. Just enlarge that thing, and I think we'll be okay. All right. I'd like to... Uh, Can you... Yep, there you go. Working? Yes. Looks good, Jim. Looks good. This is at 10x in a really busy... Uh, what do I want to call it? I took some, I took some uh, good soil, and I I knew this workshop was coming up, and I just wanted to show the levels happening live, and so this is my microscope view right now. Um, I had taken some of this soil two days ago and put it into, uh water so it's kind of an anaerobic condition and that's what you would see under anaerobic conditions as you start seeing all this life that flourishes in anaerobic conditions but these are the bigger nutrient cyclers um the the uh i also added a little bit of food to that liquid so i wanted to grow the biology that was there so i could really see what's in there. And when you add food, I'm these are things like uh, fish hydrolysis, help. Some of these things that you hear guys are adding into their sprayers, they're, they're foods for microbes. And they're trying to encourage the life and get more of this nutrient cycling happening. Because the more of this that happens, the less you have to buy. That's kind of where this is headed. And realize that our soils don't look like this. They don't, or at least most soils don't. Um, if you get to a really good functioning um, greenhouse type soil or, or maybe even an organic production, you start to see these critters. But this is weak in fungal. I'd like to see more fungal strands. Um, there are fungal spores, and I'll show you what those look like. Here's I'm zoomed in now a little bit further. This is 40 power. And those guys swimming around, those are ciliates. And if you remember from high school biology, ciliates have hairs around them. So they're, if you can really zoom in on them, they, you can see those hairs. This is now 100x. There's a flagellate going through the middle. See how he's a little smaller? Kind of roly-poly. Flagellates, if you remember from high school biology, have one or two hairs. That's why they don't move as fast, and it doesn't seem like they know where they're going. And uh, because they really don't. They're just kind of sweeping their area and pulling in bacteria to eat and cycle. And then along comes the bigger guy, the ciliate, to, to keep doing that. And all of these are, you see these yellow kind of clumps? This is the beginning of humic formation. These are actually, the yellow would be indicative of fulvic material. So you hear fulvic, you hear humic, you hear these terms. They're, they're just organic substances at various stages. 
And this would be the beginning of something that would turn into a diamond, you know, levels of carbon structure and chain. This is the very, very basic, you know, and it would go from here all the way through the to coal and peat and and uh organic matter under pressure and that's where you start getting some of those things microbes are they're the basis of all of that formation it just doesn't happen by itself so i i just wanted to impress there's a there's a different shape ciliate there uh he's kind of cool looking lots of intent you can see the you can almost see the hair now it's hard to focus on them because there's even in this drop, just one drop that I have on the slide, there's depth to it. Okay, there's a there's a fungal spore right there that I, I should have got my uh, circle tool to work, but it, my mouse is working. Is my mouse working, Anthony? Can you see that? Yes, working good. Okay, that's a fungal spore. And uh, I don't know what kind, but he's there. You also uh, see the, what else do we see here? All kinds of different bacteria, shapes, sizes, all doing different jobs. This is a healthy soil. Uh, like I said, I'd like to see some more fungi in this. This is probably indicative as because I've let this soak for a day or two. Uh, you know, I really populated that anaerobic type organism and you always hear this that you don't want anaerobic organisms i would not spray this on a plant leaf at this point uh because it would uh it might i i, I it would be risky it would be risky i would rather the plant take it up and create this population that can so it can defend itself. And that's where plant protection is coming through the same mechanisms by allowing it to get higher level of nutrition, higher level of plant health, higher bricks. If you've heard bricks, that means photosynthesis is working better. And there's there's nutrients at the right balance within the plant. So it's healthy and, and pests don't have a chance. When, when the pests are expressing themselves Something's missing out of this chain and something's filling the void. And that's what I have. That's what we're looking at right here. We, we took the oxygen away from them and, and these anaerobic organisms are taken over, the big ones. But then again, think about when it rains. This is part of the process. It's not that they're good or bad. It's just cycling the nutrients. And boy, you know how we welcome the rain and how plants look after a rain. Well, we cycled a whole bunch of nutrients. The biology took off. It can't really do this if it's all shelled up and not doing anything, or they're not there at all. Uh, so I'm gonna, from here, I'm gonna take, uh, I think I beat this to death, but I'm gonna look at a soil that is pretty typical so this is from a roundup ready soybean field okay and also same thing two days ago i took this soil i put it in a test tube and put it in water to bring things to life and just to see what's going on you can you can do an instant look as you, I mean, if you're looking for life in the soil, you can do this uh, five minutes after you take the soil. You shake it up, get it loose. You're knocking microbes off the soil. And you should, in a healthy soil, you should see all these critters. This one is highly bacterial, if you'll look. You don't have those higher level organisms. There are some things that look like fungi a little bit i'm going to focus in and you're going to see you know some humic materials there's some nutrient cycling going on here but this bacterial population is is huge 
Uh, there was a strand there. Okay, that might look like fungal, but we're going to zoom in on it and see what it is. So, Jim, you're saying that the soil ecological system is out of balance when you're saying there's too much bacteria. Well, you got to have bacteria, and a lot of bacteria is a good thing, but you got to have something to eat them. And and if you don't have something eating them, those nutrients are, you know, the bacteria is going to live and die. And there's going to be nutrient cycling going on. But the higher level nutrient cycling to clean these guys up and keep them in check uh, probably isn't happening at the level we'd like it. Well, that's that's the that's what is happening is 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 what we call um, immobilization. Right. Right. So these bacteria are tying up a lot of M, right? They need one to five carbon, nitrogen to carbon, or five to one carbon to nitrogen. And this is actually, uh, uh, there again, it, it's, it's probably favored anaerobically because they've been in the water. Now, when I looked at this yesterday, I saw a fair amount of um, actinobacteria. And I was hoping to show you that. Actinobacteria are the bacteria that, and it might just be the sample that I drew, did, just didn't really hit them, but they're the ones that you, you hear about that give the soil its good smell. And they're, they're a very basic, there's a chain of actinobacteria there, you can see. Uh, they start forming a filamentous material, but it's bacterial, okay? So it's a good thing to have. It's part of it, but you don't want anything to be dominated by these because they 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 are facultative. They can work in oxygen or without oxygen. And if you're dominated, that means you're moving towards a, towards a condition that is lacking oxygen. So uh, in composting, for example, if your whole pile turns white, it you'll see those white uh, networks that begin to form in composting. It's part of the process, but that's actinobacteria. And and I, I, I just explored this from a lot of different areas. I don't really, I'm not an expert on any of it, but I, my job is to try to communicate what's going on here and what it means for your farm. And uh, so what I think is going on here is we're, we're cut off. The higher level organisms are, are not there. There's nutrient cycling going on, but this field is gonna have, it's gonna take some other inputs to get to the, to the level of the yields we're used to or want to see. And it's because it's not fully available uh, and this is where most of our soils are. So I don't know what that is. I would say that's a long strand of actinobacteria right there. I'm pretty sure. Uh, this bubble is starting to dry out. That's why everything's moving in one direction. It's been on the under the microscope now for close to an hour or so. Uh, but good, good fungal pieces. And this is, I was talking about, or I'm sorry, not fungal, uh, human, uh, fulvic. These are pieces of organic matter that are forming. They're in the soil. And that's because there's, there's some good things going on here. The soil building happens in spite of the conditions. Uh, so th those will eventually become aggregates. They will be, yes. And it, those are these pieces that are stuck to the roots, right? And, yep. And, um, yeah. I'm so... Gonna, these are weak, they would be considered weak aggregates and and any disturbance will will reverse reverse yeah. that formation. Or yes, and in a lot of times uh like a tillage event, you see this has been measured over and over and over. When you when you turn the soil, you can smell the, you know, you can smell it. That's attractive. That's the actinobacteria, but they're dying. 
because they're putting that odor off. And that they also, the, uh, uh, the amount of CO2 that comes off of a soil as it's freshly turned is a result of these bacteria now having access to all these particles that they didn't have before. It's even more so. So they really take off. You'll get a huge bacterial flush with every tillage. You'll also get some nutrient availability with some tillage. But there's a fine balance in there between keeping your microbes alive and happy and fed to keep this system working as opposed to, you know, a quick nutrient access tillage event that makes my crop look good that year. But I'm going to, it's going to, over the, over time, it's going to take more and more fertilizer. Now, I don't, that's, that's a bold statement, but that, that's really what I see happening here with this uh, nutrient cycling and, and how much of it we have depends on whether we have all these critters there. And there's ways to inoculate your soils and put them out there and, and get things going in the right direction. What I was doing here is bringing the, uh, they call it epifluorescence, which is that wavelength of light. Okay, I turned off the main lamp and now I'm lighting from the top with epifluorescence. And this has become more affordable. It used to take about a $20,000 microscope to do this. And now uh, it's down to about 7,000. So that's, that's nice. But because I was a member of this class, I got it for half price. <laughs> and it's this ability to look with this other wavelength at a piece of, as Anthony said, you know, these are the basic fulvic materials but under the phosphorescence, the phosphorus glows, just like a black light. So you can see those pieces in there. There's phosphorus, and that's a that's that's in there. You know, it's it's available as the microbes bring it to the plant through that rhizophagy process. So that's two two different soil situations. And uh, how are we doing on time here? I got some time. I want to leave time for questions, but this is one thing we'll take a quick look at. It's if 20, I... it's 20 to 11. Okay. So you've got, yeah, you've got 10 minutes or, or so and, and, um, okay. and you're doing good. I'm going to go back to my main lamp, turn off the epifluorescence. here. We're now we're shadowed. What we're looking at here is actually a flax root that I have growing. I just pulled this this morning, about an hour ago. I dug up a flax plant and tried to get to the very, very new growth. I didn't do a very good job because I heard that plant just snap and break, but I wanted to use flax. I don't know if it was the right choice or not. I have several different things growing. But it it shows us what, what we're talking about here. This is back at 10X and... Uh, this is some of the organic material that's fallen off of that uh, from the from the root itself as it snapped. And I put this on a slide. So you would not use a cover slip with this. It's just looking down at a plant root at not very high magnification. Now, the next thing I want to do is, is bring in light from a different angle. And this is... This is just kind of neat because it 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 makes a nice picture. And I'm going to turn that bottom light off. We just we just went to space, it looks like. <laughs> it it's just really neat. I'm gonna so that that big white blob is is uh just a refraction that's going on, and I'm gonna center this light. But I, I'm sorry, the one up in the upper left that I moved off. There's some mineral there. This is just light from my cell phone down on this root. And uh, it's just crazy. All these little networks that are in this material. Are there some droplets there or am I imagining I, things? I thought the same thing, Anthony. I, I don't know. I... I, uh, it could be, 
it could be i think there's just more moisture in these roots so it is reflecting the light so yes and no but i mean it's a whole nother world and this is just i don't know it's powerful for me to look at because you start understanding this rhizophagy cycle and all the little things that are happening for nutrient cycling uh what a neat world and how accessible this is that it it wasn't this accessible all that long ago anybody can do this and uh look for these critters and to think that the slides that you were showing us before with all of the microbes swimming and floating around is essentially inside these these dark exactly when we take your soil and rinse it off into the liquid, that's what we're looking at in the drop. I mean, there's a there's a little root tip right there. Well, um, I have a quick comment. Yeah. So do you have to look at roots that are actively growing in the soil so, to see this? Or can you look at roots in air-dried soil that you have sitting around? You can. And that's where, um, I mean, the fresher, the better, I think. Because, you know, as it dries out, you're going to lose the water and you'll probably get a, a different image. You won't, it won't be as reflective, but my goodness, I'm going to even try to go up another, that was 10 X. Okay. Here we are at a hundred. I'm sorry, 40. And, and dialed into just one of those little tiny areas of. This is this is what you hear about with mycorrhizal fungi accessing a greater portion of the soil resource. And uh, you know, I'm gonna do a lot of work comparing this to soils in other situations and roots in other growing situations, and just to see it, see what the differences are. No one's really done a lot of this work yet. This is this is cutting edge stuff. And uh, there's 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 years of study figuring out what's going on at this level. Jim, uh, do, do you so. do you envision a day where you you think um, that an agronomist will have a microscope and look at materials and products and soils and and make general recommendations based upon what they're seeing? I do. And I that protocol is being written today. It it's it's being outlined um outside of you know it's in the regenerative circles. There's people that are way down the path. Dr. James White is one of them. I could share some resources to to some of his work, but you'll you'll find him all over on, on YouTube or wherever you want to find him. Yeah, but it, if you can ever go hear him speak, that's what he's talking about is this root level nutrient exchange that's happening. And it doesn't happen in if conditions aren't right. So there again, I think it's happening, but when we, we're, our current systems with a lot of chemistry out there, a lot of fungicides, a lot of the things we're doing are limiting the diversity of those of those communities and and really you know regenerative celebrating the life in the soil and appreciating what it can do um is really what this is about and uh you know it it it's it's been largely ignored for many years now a lot of this happened the way we farm for thousands and thousands of years in agriculture you know, before the advent of the modern fertilizers, intuitively, if you were going to keep fertility, you were adding things like organic matter through manures and and layering uh, carbon to nitrogen ratios through cover crops. Well, that kept that microbial community alive and thriving. And and uh, I I just want to throw that out there and and realize that uh there's something to this and there's a lot more work that needs to be done to understand how to make a prescription 
uh, based on this life. A lot of it is just trial and error. Uh, I've been working on a lot of that. I know Anthony's been helping me work on a lot of that and try to understand this and what it means. But a regenerative system is using less and less of off-farm inputs to maintain yields. Also, you're trying to increase the quality, which may cost you yield in some cases, but the quality is better. Hopefully the markets can reward that and and just have a uh, an overall better system working in our soils that's going to last for a long long time uh, the the plant that i pulled this morning actually this is this is oats i just wanted to show this this do you see oh, it's going to i'm in the way The rhizophagy cycle here, these, these things are just stuck to these roots. And that's the way every plant we grow should look when the biology is happening. I'm sorry, it's, you can see the seed and the roots. And that, that's what we were looking at through the microscope, okay? Just all the way down. And that, these snapped off too. So the good stuff is still in that pot. But. Okay. Any questions? There are some questions for you. Yeah. Okay. So let me scroll up to the top of them. Um, one person asked if you were using regular seed treatments on your soybeans. I'm assuming that would be on your brother's farm, but. We have not. We've been trying to use naked soybeans. But we are growing Roundup Ready soybeans. Uh, actually, this year it'll be in list. And I'm going to monitor this all the way through just to see, uh, you know, the effects. So we have Okay, and I think here's another good question. And I think that this would have to do with how good the microbiome is working in the soil. And... Would a fungal seed inoculate be a one and done application or would it require multiple years of application? It depends on the system. Um, mycorrhizal fungi can persist on a living root and it will sporulate. And uh, it'll leave those spores. If conditions are good, you shouldn't have to do it again. Just like rhizobium is an example. Once you have that, you shouldn't have to put that on seed. But we always do just to ensure that it's there again. Um, I think that, you know, we don't understand the effects of some of the the chemistry we're using on, on these critters. And from what I'm seeing, and I'm not making any just assumptions here. It's just what I've seen uh, when, I, when looking at soils, I, I'm not seeing these higher level organisms in, in highly chemical soils. I, I think I'm gonna share the QR code on the screen so people can people can get their CCA credits. And but there's a couple more questions to ask you. So if you to get your CCA credits, you can scan the QR code. Does using conventional seed treatments have a negative effect on our soil microbiome? Soil biome. There again, it's a. It depends on the situation, and our soils are very, very resilient. You know, seed treatments are generally uh, targeting the larger critters, the higher organisms. So, you know. We're taking out the good with the bad, and and it's leaving a community not present to provide defense. So, you know, you can't go broke because some some nasty bug or fungi is attacking your plant, but you have to look at the deeper question is, why is this plant vulnerable? Why am I seeing these problems? And, you know, we try to breed for resistance well we're really finding plants that have cultured the right biology to provide that 
So it, there's a connection here. Like I said, and you remember the very first diagram, there's pieces of this puzzle that all have to come into play. And if we're leaning too strongly one direction, something else is not being met as far as the life in the soil is concerned. So I, I'm not going to say don't use these things. They do have an effect. Yes, I, what that is, we don't really know because we haven't really understood this before. What? The rhizophagy cycle was discovered 10 it years ago. One, one more thought about the last question is there's an opportunity, I think, to... So these endophytes oftentimes are expressed through the offspring, just like uh, genetics in people, you know, it it shows up in the offspring. So the seed from a plant with endophytes is going to have that biology in the seed for the next generation. And there's an opportunity to do all kinds of work with getting the right plant protection through biology uh, and looking at responses there rather than simply just yield. So it it's exciting to me to think about that you know, to, uh, to, to take another approach to plant breeding, to take advantage of these systems. So the next question is, do we even remotely have any idea on what our impact of glyphosate application is on soil microbiology where active ingredient transposes to the roots? Related to clarify, if glyphosate kills the roots as widely advertised, then what does it what does that mean to the microbiology interacting with those roots? There's a good paper that I came across, and I believe it was put out by the University of Florida, that kind of did a summary and a meta-analysis of different work that's being done with this. And, uh, you know, kind of what I take from it is you have to have a little bit of an understanding of how glyphosate works and how it was, how it translocates and and what it does and why a uh, a gmo type plant can survive it and yet other roots cannot well we're taking a, a chink out of the system and uh so it 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 takes some more looking at what 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 is happening is it actually is pumping the glyphosate out through these root hairs and the biology, some biology can can cycle that, some can't. And the in the process of glyphosate, I think we're limiting our community. So, uh, our the breeding system recognizes that, and it is designed to work in that environment. Those genetics are designed to work in that environment to work with that biology that's there, but I feel it's it's now limited. And, you know, we're, we're looking at yield as the measure rather than the quality. And uh, that's, that's what keeps us in business, I understand. But what if uh, the rest of those players were there? I think our yields actually can go up from here once we have a better understanding of these things. Now that's also a bold statement, but this is this is why we have to do all this work. There's just a ton of work to be done to understand 
the rhizophagy, which we didn't even know existed until just recently. So it, it's going to turn this whole nutrient management discussion on its head. And as we understand this. And, and I would like to, you know, put it out there that if you would like me to come and teach this in some event of wherever people are, I'd be happy to do that. And also that this, this webinar will be uploaded onto the SDSU Extension YouTube page if you would like to view this again or share it with someone else to view. So. So I put my phone number up there. That's the best way to reach me. Okay, that sounds good. And if anyone has any more questions for me, they can contact me too. So thanks a lot for being with us today and presenting. I think people enjoyed your presentation. So I no, think it's that's certainly a call for more work, more research, right? Yeah, I think we need to do more research on soil biology and how it affects grain yields. And I think there's a lot of potential to improve sustainability with better understanding of the soil biology. Thanks everyone for attending.